In this episode, we are going to be having a chit chat with Michael Uma. He's going to be telling us a bit about himself, but we're also going to be picking his mind on the topic of passion driven learning. So stick around. Welcome to the show, Millennials. If we're meeting for the very first time, my name is Joan Chirabo, and I am very passionate about growth and personal development. On this channel, we share tips and strategies on how to stand out, win at life, and be the best versions of ourselves while at it. So if you're interested in those kinds of things, you should consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any of the content we share here. Michael Oma. Uh, Michael Oma is two, uh, two different people. Uh, there's Michael Oma, the statistician and uh, accountant. Then there's Michael Oma, the musician. Um, definitely the more common Michael Oma is the musician because that's the one in the limelight. Um, I did B start at the university, at Macquarie University, and that was after Macquarie College School for six years. During my time in secondary school, I was doing music as, a, as an academic discipline, but it was, it was my passion as well, because I was doing um, music in church as well, and playing traditional instruments with uh, certain different local troops. So I was basically building who I was going to be later on, uh, without really knowing the, the yes, without knowing the, the exact defined pattern, but I was just doing my thing. So there was still the music going on, but the academics were going on as well. So um, I got to a point after university when I had to decide what I want to do as number one, what I wanted to do as number two. So I was done with statistics and I had to either get a full-time employment job, an eight to five job, or I had to go on tour. And the decision was actually, the decision had to be made very quick, chap chap, so to say. Because um, when I was doing my last exam, um, in the afternoon, I had a flight for my first tour. <laughs> yes. So before exams, I had to decide if I was gonna do an interview for a full-time job, I was going to stay and apply for the tour that I was supposed to go for. Was it a hard decision to make? Was that a hard decision? Well, yes and no. Yes, it was hard because there was many other factors involved. Parents, other stakeholders, friends, family. Everybody gives their piece of advice. I don't blame somebody because that's what they know. And that's what they think is best. And definitely there's people that have good intentions for you but not all the time um, what I think is best is what is best. Then there's also the element of passion because if I'm not doing something that I like, I'll do it and get the money and then I'll be bored at some point. I'm just like waiting for 5 p.m. and then I'm out. And then I've always loved traveling. I've loved uh, interacting with different musicians, different people, different societies, um, sceneries like Exploring life, there's more to life than just where you're born. So that was another advantage of doing music because I would get to travel and meet different people. So I said, let me give it a year, since the degree is there anyway. I can come back to it, let me give it a year, <clears throat> try out music and try it and see where it takes me. So I did my last exam in the morning and flew out in the afternoon for my first tour. And I never looked back. Yeah, I think I would have gone on tour a bit earlier. <laughs> Not that I should have done before. I mean, if I had the opportunity before, I still would have done it and probably back and forth. I don't regret either one of them because I use both. 
when I was done with university, I still did a bit of start as um, contract on contract jobs, but it was more for the money, and it was also like to keep the brain active. And I use I use that knowledge for my own businesses. Um, there was mixed reactions because you see, uh, how do I put that? In Uganda, so they say, it was, it was more about what they knew. They knew if you're done with school, you definitely get a job in what you studied. Yes, it's created. Yeah, what I, what I usually call the ruler life. <laughs> like after 10 centimeters, you go to 11, after this, you go to this. Which is okay for people that are not explorative, I would say. Like we don't, people that don't, yeah, they don't step out of their comfort zone, don't think outside the box. Like you're within a cocoon, your life is within there, you do what you know. And it's not a bad thing because within those dimensions, you know what's right and what's wrong. Then there's people like us who are trendsetters. We explore, we like to take the risks. So there was that back and forth. No, I'm gonna do this, no, that, that's not right. You should probably do this. This would be better. You've studied this, it's easier this way. You don't know where you're going. What if it works, what if it doesn't, things like that. So it wasn't that easy. It took a bit of, uh, a bit of time for both of us to come to the same footing and say, okay, I think you're doing your thing, we probably don't understand what you're doing, but do your thing, we wish you the best, hopefully it works out, something like that, yeah. 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 Um, I think um, as somebody that is inspiring a new, a ne the next generation, whether as a father, whether as a mentor, whether as a role model, I think we have to appreciate that every generation has its struggles, its advantages and what it knows. Because in the days, say, of uh, my grandparents, it was about farming. So they would ensure that all the children uh, had to farm before they went to school. They wake up at about 4 a.m., go dig, um, make sure that they, they, there's some good cultivation going on so there's a nice harvest and then they can make money and they can pay their fees. So it was all about how well can you dig. It, yes, then it moved on to the Western form of education, which was the era of our parents. And then it's about bragging. The bragging now is no longer about how many kids you have and how well they can dig, how well they can hunt. You're, you're bragging about how many of your kids are in school. Yes, who is very bright, how many lawyers you have in the family, how many doctors, how many engineers, the traditional disciplines that we knew. Then there was many of those. So you have to now think outside the box. If we're all doctors, who's gonna treat who? We're all engineers, who's gonna do what? You get, they have to be now the other people because everybody's probably tired during the day. And then the question is, what are they gonna do in the evening? They need some entertainment. So that's where they're probably gonna come in. Uh, back in the day, things like sports were just for fun. Now the richest people in the world are sportsmen but it's just trends that move. So it's not really a question of, to me, it's not a question of just saying um, someone should do this. I don't stipulate that for you. Probably in the days to come, um, carpentry will be the in thing, the richest people will be carpenters. 
If that's what someone wants to do and it's going to make them money as their passion, so be it. Because there's a reason why God created a certain person with a certain talent. So if that particular person sits on their talent, it's, I think it's not right. I think it's, um, in a way I can say, disrespectful to God. Because there's billions of people in the world and He chose you. So if He gave you a talent and you prefer to sit on it, I think it's not right. So I would encourage someone to use their talent, but uh, their talent and passion have to be monetized. That's why I'm saying there's an advantage of going to school and getting a formal education and learning especially about economics, business, how the world trends work. Because you could be a very great basketball player, but you only play on your home court. You will have fun and enjoy, but you can't monetize it. Yeah, you go out there, make money out of it, have fun with it, but also have a plan B, because you can break your legs and hands, and tomorrow you need a plan B. You have to have an investment or something. So there's a lot involved in it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the education system in Uganda needs to evolve and the same way it's evolving the whole world over. Because if we stay studying about Badang, the strongest man in Singapore back in the day, I mean it was a good story or a legend so to say, but I don't think we have that much time now. <laughs> the world is like, yeah, kids in, in Asia make disco watches for homework at like a tender age and you're still talking about Bukuku the gatekeeper. Like it's good to know that he was probably there or know about your history. There are certain things that you need to know that are going to help you move forward because it's not a global village. Whether you go back to my village or you're in New York City or in Australia, if I release something on YouTube, you all get it the same time. You can stream live what's going on in a certain place all at the same time. So there's no leverage anymore of saying well, we're in a third world country, we'll catch up later, we're just, we're, we're still slowly by slowly changing the curriculum, there's no time. So I think it's high time that the education system is, well, uh, was changed. We need, we need it to be more involving and um, we need to encourage the children to pursue their passion and talent because the co-curricular activities right now as I said the areas have changed we're in the era where it's more talent based you you can monetize any talent people work on their phones they practically stay home and make a lot of money on phone and you wonder how someone does that but he's probably good with tech then there's somebody else that is he just swims that's it and he's building mansions. You get? Yeah, it brings in money. But still, if he's also not uh, formally educated into the discipline of finances, he's probably going to make some wrong decisions and probably doesn't even know about investment. So there's that aspect that's needed. So I think it just needs to be enterprising and you need lots of things involved. We can't stay on the old education system and still be following um, concepts of the 1950s. The times have changed. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you too. Question of the day. What changes do you think the education system of Uganda can implement to accommodate passion-driven learning? And this should start from kindergartens, preschools to kindergartens to primary schools, secondary schools, institutions, all the way. I think it's something we have to build from the ground up. So what changes do you think that the education system can implement? Please leave your recommendations in the comment section below. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching. I hope we have juggled your mind a bit on the topic of passion-driven learning. And if we have, you're in luck because the series still continues. In the next episode, we're going to be having a chit-chat with someone in the performing arts industry. She has literally lived 
and loved the journey of passion-driven learning and passion-driven living. You're going to surely be learning a few lessons from her testimony. So I hope you stick around for the next episode. Bye!